Grandmaster Orwell, free from the dungeon, and once more adorned the chain of his office, gives us a detailed look inside the restored Green Council during this trouble and turbulent time, when fear and suspicion held sway even within the walls of the Red Keep. At the very time when unity was most desperately required, the lords around King Aegon II found themselves deeply divided and unable to agree on how best to deal with the gathering storm. The sea snake Corlys Velaryon favoured reconciliation, pardons and peace. Boris Brathian scorned that course as weakness. He would defeat these traitors in the field, he declared to the king and council. All he required was men. Castley Rock and Old Town should be commanded to raise fresh levies at once. So Tyler Lannister, the blind master of coin, proposed to sail to Lys or Tyrosh and engage one or more Salsor companies. Aegon II did not lack for coin like his sister did, as Sir Tyland had placed three quarters of the crown's wealth safely in the hands of Castley Rock, Old Town, and the Iron Bank of Bravos before Queen Rhaenyra had seized the capital and the treasury. Lord Valarian saw such efforts as futile. We do not have the time. Children sit in the seats of power at Old Town and Castley Rock. We will find no more help there. The best three companies are bound by contract to Lee Smear or Tyrosh. Even if Sir Tyland could prize them loose, he cannot bring them here in time. My ships can keep the Arons from our doors, but who will stop the Northmen and the Lords of the Trident? They are already on the march. We must make terms. The king should absolve all of them and their crimes and treasons and proclaim Rhaenyra's son by Daemon, Aegon, his heir, and marry him at once to Princess Jehera. It is the only way. Old man's words fell upon deaf ears, however. Queen Alicent reluctantly ag agreed to the betrothal of her granddaughter to Rhaenyra's son, but she had done so without the king's consent. Aegon had other ideas altogether. He wished to marry Cassandra Baratheon at once, for she will give me strong sons, worthy of the Iron Throne. Nor would he allow Prince Aegon to wed his daughter, and perhaps sire sons who might muddy the succession and cause another dance all over again. He can take the black and join the Night's Watch, spend his days at the wall, his grace decreed, or else give up his manhood and serve me as a eunuch. The choice is his, but he shall have no children. My sister's line must end. Even though that was thought to be too gentle a course by Sir Tyler Lannister, who argued for the immediate execution of Prince Aegon the Younger, the boy will remain a threat, so long as he draws breath, Sir Tyler declared. Remove his head, and these traitors will be left with neither a queen, nor a king, nor prince. They'll have no banner to rally around. The sooner he is dead, the sooner this rebellion will end. His words and those of the king horrified Lord Valarian, the aged sea snake. Thunderous, in his wrath, accused king and council of being fools, liars, and oathbreakers, and stormed from the chamber. Boros Baratheon then offered to bring the king the old man's head, and Aegon II was on the point of giving his consent when Lord Larry Strong, the clubfoot, spoke up, reminding them that the young Alan Valarian, the sea snake's heir, remained beyond their reach on Driftmark. Kill the old snake and we lose the young one, the clubfoot said and all those fine swift ships of theirs as well. Instead, he said, they must make a move at once to make amends with Lord Corless, so as to keep House Valarian on their side. Give him his betrothal, your grace, he urged the king. A betrothal is not a wedding. Name young Aegon your heir. A prince is not a king. Look back in history and count how many heirs never lived to sit the Iron Throne. Deal with Driftmark in due course, when your foes are vanquished and your tide is at its full. That day is not yet come. We must bide our time and speak gently to him until then. Or so his words have come down to us from Maester Orwell by way of Munkin. Neither Septon Eustace nor the full Mushroom was present at the council. Yet Mushroom speaks of it all the same, saying there was ever a man as devious as a clubfoot. Or he would have made a splendid fool, that one. The words dripped from his lips like honey from a comb, and never did poison taste so sweet. The enigma that is Larry Strong the clubfoot has vexed the studies of the Seven Kingdoms for generations, and is not one we can hope to unravel here. Where did his true loyalties lie? What was he about? He wove his way all through the Dance of the Dragons, on this side and that, vanishing and reappearing, but somehow always surviving. How much of what he said and did was a ruse? How much was real? Was he just a man who sailed with the prevailing wind? Or did he know where he was bound when he set out? So may we ask, 
but none will answer. The last strong keeps his secrets. We do know that he was sly, secretive, yet plausible and pleasant when need be. His words swayed the king and his council in their course. When Queen Alison demurred, wondering aloud how Lord Corlett could possibly be won back after all that happened, after all that had been said that day, Lord Strong replied, The task you may leave to me, your grace. His lordship will listen to me, I dare say. And so he did, for though none knew it, at the time the club that went directly to the sea snake when the council was dismissed and told him of the king's intent to grant him all he had requested and murder him later when the war was done and when the old man could have stormed out swords in hand to exact bloody revenge lord laris soothed him with a soft word and smiles there is a better way he said counselling patience and thus did he spin his web of deceit and betrayal setting each against the other <laughs>